turn it over to you. Well, so I was going to suggest that we check it. Uh, well, so my thought, all right, so, sorry. Jim wants to do the welcome. Great. So we'll sing our verse to him. He'll do the welcome. And then I was going to open it up for announcements and just direct them from here. And, and I can point them back to you and say, you know, Ryan Baker has an announcement about. There, I think there is two. You know what? Carry that one back there with you. And that way there's definitely one back there. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. Okay. Ron has sure that's what's on the PowerPoint. Um, can you run, can you remind me of how this sounds? I, I looked at it over the weekend. I'm, my brain is not.
I met God in the morning when my day was at its best, and His presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. All day long the presence lingered. All day long He stayed with me, and we sailed in perfect calmness o'er a very troubled sea. Other ships were tossed and battered, other ships were sore distressed, and the winds that seemed to drive them brought to me a peace and rest. Then I thought of other mornings with a keen remorse of mind, when I too had loosed the moorings with the presence left behind. So I think I know the secret learned from many a troubled way. We should seek God in the morning if we want Him through the day. Good morning. morning. Rodney and his wife are in Texas, I believe, attending, or maybe it's already over now, but the graduation of a daughter, and so I'm filling in. It's always a joy to come back to the church that sent me out. Uh, The Christians were first... (laughs) That didn't sound right. (laughs) Bad money always returns. But the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And it was from the church in Antioch that Paul and Barnabas went out on their first of several missionary journeys. And they always would come back to that church and give a report. And so uh, in the fall of 1959, didn't seem that long. Time flies when you're having fun, they say, but in 1959, this church sent me out with a Thompson Chain Reference Bible that I still have in treasure, but I went out to, uh, in the fall of 59 to Asbury College, now Asbury University, and then Asbury Seminary, and, but preceding me, uh, L.D. Payton went out of this church, L.D. pastored churches in Kentucky, then Kansas, then came back to finish his ministry in Indiana where he now lives, and then uh, I went out in 59 and spent all of my life in in Kentucky, and then uh, a few years after me, Corky Klingenfuss was sent out from this church and pastored churches in Kentucky and Michigan and then came back and, and worked at Southeast for a while, and now he's retired. But it's always good to come back to the church that means so much to me. You perhaps have already heard, but uh, I'm taking a church at conference time. Uh, Owen Dolan and I will be co-pastoring the Milton United Methodist Church in Trimble County. And uh, we look forward to that. Our first Sunday will be July the 4th, and we're going to get started with a bang. (laughs) But uh, anyway, you remember us in prayer, will you? Welcome, and we're glad you're here. Are there any announcements or anything, Robin? Okay. I'm just going to stay put. Ooh, hi. I'm going to stay put. Um... I wanted to uh, just call your attention to an email that went out, and and Ryan Baker is back in the back, and he's going to talk to us about that um, here right now. Did anybody have any other announcements that they needed for us to make today? Yep. Okay, so we need. Whoa, I'm so loud. <laughs> we need some more. Uh, we need some help with the blessings in a backpack deliveries. There are two more deliveries that need to happen this year. Um, so if you, Terry, can they contact you for that? Yeah, or sign up on the sheet. Or if you're if you're here in person and you want to sign up on the sign up sheet, that would be great. All right. Well, there's no further, without any further ado, let's, um, if, uh, I don't know, would anybody be willing to ring the bell? I'm looking straight at the pew full of children. Yes, Amelia, go ring the bell. Amelia's going to ring the bell, and while that's happening, if you guys wanted to stand up and get ready for our opening hymn.
applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus is with me, abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory Pontius Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and, and the, the life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we get ready for prayer, are there any prayer requests or glory sightings you'd like to share with us this morning? Yes. When are they due back, you know? I'm not going to tell. <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Jerry? Again, I'd like to remember our daughter. She's uh, sitting in the chest number. Okay. And Norm, yes. All right. I guess this is a uh, something to praise. But anyway, today is Norman's birthday. He's not here. I think they have a graduation in their uh, family uh, today, a grandson. So uh, anyway, let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, what a joy it is to be in your house this morning. We read that verse in the book of Psalms quite often, and we can picture it in our mind that we took sweet counsel together and went to the house of God in company. 
We thank you so much for the privilege and the joy that brings us here. You are God and there is none like unto you. You deserve all the honor and all the praise. You love us even when we're unlovable. We thank you so much for forgiving us of our sin and adopting us into your family. We are now sons and daughters of the Most High. How good you are. And we know that you do not turn a deaf ear to the cries of your children. We know that you delight in our praises. When Jesus made his triumphal entry on that first Palm Sunday, the Bible says the city went wild with excitement, and the Pharisees said, Lord, tell your disciples to calm down. And Jesus said, if they calm down, the rocks will cry out and praise me. So we thank you that we can praise you in song this morning. We know that you know the, the, every heart that is here. You can read our minds. And you know those who are hurting. We think of these requests that have just been made. You know everything about them. And Lord, there's really nothing that we can do except to pray and to hope. Paul said to the Philippian church, but the God I serve and the God who loves me will supply all I need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So we bring these, our friends and loved ones, to you, and we leave them with you and pray, Lord, that your will might be done in their life. And whatever is accomplished for good, we'll praise you for it and give you thanks. We love you. We thank you for your love for us and all of these prayer requests and the unspoken ones as well. We ask in the name that is above every name, who teaches us to pray when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, Jim's here, which means we're doing a lot of singing. Um, we actually don't have a children's moment for us this morning, so we're going to do two hymns back to back. So, y'all stand up and join us, please, for At Calvary, and we'll follow that up with the Old Rugged Cross.
think you know the custom you've been having for the past several months about the offering. You leave it back there, I believe, in the plates as you come in or as you leave. We appreciate uh, your faithfulness to your church in the offering way. So let's have the offertory prayer, and then we'll sing the doxology. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your gifts to us. We are a blessed people, a blessed church. And we just want to prove to you and show you that our love for you is genuine as we give back to you your tithe and beyond that as we're able and led of your spirit, our offerings. Bless them, we pray, for your work in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Before I preach, uh, I want to show you three slides, if we can see them on the, the screen now. Uh, two Sundays ago, I was standing right there at the base of the cross in this amphitheater in Costa Rica. It is a very beautiful, a very inspirational, and a very worshipful place. And we begin every day's work uh, with worship in the amphitheater. Uh, the next one, please. And this is me having devotions. And then the next one, we'll leave this up here, the cross. That cross was planted by a mission team from Georgia in 1988. It was power washed and painted two years ago by the mission team I took down. And then last year, uh, I got the idea, hey, we're missing the nails. So uh, we put the nails in there last year. But uh, God willing, we're going to go back uh, next year in 2022. Uh, the dates are January the 29th through February 6th, just one week. I would love to have at least one person out of the Tabor Church take a mission trip. How many of you have ever been on a mission trip? Okay, well, several, good, okay. But it's a real joy and a blessing. We do construction work, men, uh, whatever you can do in construction work, why, we'd love to have you go with us. What I want to share today is unlike any sermon, or I won't call it a sermon, any, any, well, for lack of a better word, any sermon I've ever preached. This is really not a sermon. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount. But Matthew 5, 1 says this, And seeing the multitudes, he, Jesus, went up on a mountain, sat down, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. Then then the Beatitudes, and then chapters, the rest of chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And the last verse in chapter 7 says this. And they were amazed at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. So, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. That's okay, I have no problem with that, but to me, it's kind of like a seaside lesson on how to live a good life. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. A seaside lesson on how to live a good life. Now let me ask you a question. How many crosses do you think are in this church, either the beautiful one on the communion table, there's two more that's part of the woodwork down below, how many crosses do you think are visible in this sanctuary? What would you say if I told you there are probably a couple of hundred? They're all around the top of every light fixture. There's some in the window panes. The cross and the flame is on the front of every United Methodist hymnal, which will be hopefully be placed back pretty soon. So there are hundreds of crosses just in this sanctuary. Now let me share with you what I, I came to do this morning. Have any of you ever heard of a Lawrence P. 
Peter Barron. Neither have I. Have you ever heard of Yogi Berra? Yes. All of us have heard of Yogi. Now, it all started in St. Louis back in May of 1925 when a baby boy was born to the Berra family and they named him Lawrence Peter. Now, I'm sure they probably called him Pete for short. I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, uh, he was born back in 1925 in St. Louis. Now, the question is, how did he get his nickname of Yogi? How many of you had a nickname when you were in school? Oh, come on, you're, you're, you're ashamed of it, aren't you? Yeah. Given enough time, all of you would raise your hands. I had a nickname that followed me even beyond my high school days, and some of you know what it is. I'm not telling the rest of you because I'd never live it down if I told you. <laughs> or do you want to know, Doug? <laughs> all through high school and beyond, when I saw some of my, my former classmates, I was little hots. My dad was hotshot. You remember my dad? He was big hots and I was little hots. So how did Pete Barra become Yogi Barra? Well, let me tell you the story. Pete, when he started playing ball, played American Legion, not American League, but he played in the American Legion League. And most of the teams did not even have a dugout, much less a stadium. And so the players would just sit on the ground or stand around until it came their turn to bat. And one of his friends saw Pete sitting on the ground. His legs were crossed. His arms were folded, assuming the posture of a yogi. Now, what is a yogi? A yogi is a Hindu holy man. You've seen pictures of them. They're just sitting there. And so the fellow said, Pete... You look like a yogi. And from that day until September the 22nd, 2015, when he died at the age of 90, it was Yogi Berra. Now, if a Hindu holy man is called a yogi, what do you call a Hindu holy woman? Not a trick, just what? You folk would never make it on Jeopardy. <laughs> Alex Trebek would be ashamed of you. A female Hindu woman, a holy woman, uh, is a yogini. Y-O-G-I-N-I, -I, a yogini. Well, let me ask you some more. What do you call a group of whales? A pod. A pod. Hey, you're, you're getting better, a pod. What do you call a group of lions? A pride. Wow, you're sharp. <laughs> what do you call a group of giraffes? And the name is appropriate. It's called a tower. A tower. And I learned this this past Thanksgiving. What do you call a group of turkeys? And it's not Methodist preachers. So, <laughs> what do you call a group of turkeys? They're called a rafter, like rafters in a house, R-A-F-T-E-R. Can I give you one more? What do you call a bunch of baboons? Are you ready for this? A bunch of baboons is called a congress. <laughs> that explains the mess we're in. We've got a bunch of baboons running the country. It's amazing what you learn when you come to church. <laughs> Let me get back to Yogi. Eventually, I'm going to take you to the cross, okay? We're good. <laughs> just bear with me. Yogi played 19 years of professional baseball. Eight or uh, 19 years, 18 with the Yankees, 
And then the last year, he was the manager coach for the New York Mets. In 19 years, Yogi made the All-Star team 18 times. Incredible. He played in 14 World Series and won the championship 10 times. No player has even come close to that today. In 1956, the World Series was between the New York Yankees and their crosstown rivals, the then Brooklyn Dodgers. And in Game 5 of the World Series in 1956, with Yogi behind the plate, Don Larson pitched the only perfect game ever played in all the World Series games that have been played. Only one. 27 players came to the plate with their bat, and 27 players took their bat back to the dugout. No runs, no hits, no errors, and no walks. A perfect game. The only Dodger player to come close was Pee Wee Reese from Louisville. Remember? He was the only player that went to a three-ball count. What I want to tell you about that is that when the final out was made, it's one of the greatest pictures in sports, certainly in baseball. But when the final out was made, Don Larson throws his glove up in the air and dashes toward home plate. And Yogi rips his catcher's mask off and heads toward the pitcher's mound, and they meet somewhere about halfway, and Yogi literally leaps into the arm of Don Larson. His legs are wrapped around his waist. What a guy. But Yogi was also somewhat uh, a, a philosopher. Yogi said things that would make you think. When Yogi said something, you either nodded your head, that's right, or you scratched your head and thought, I have no idea what he's saying. That was Yogi. We call him Yogiisms. For instance, Yogi said this, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Think about that. That's, that, that's heavy. Yogi said baseball is 90% mental and the other half physical. Yogi said you can observe a lot just by watching. Think about that. Yogi said a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. <laughs> Yogi said about a certain restaurant, nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. Yogi calls up and orders a pizza, and he says, cut it in four pieces, I can't eat eight. <laughs> Here's my good one, I say this, I like this one. Remember this, Yogi said, always, always go to other people's funerals, otherwise they won't come to yours. <laughs> what a guy. Yogi was a Catholic by faith. I don't know how devout he may have been, that's irrelevant, but he was a Catholic by faith. Uh, how many of you have seen people, you know, they cross, have you seen that? That, that? Pretty much identifies them as being a Catholic, and I admire them for it. They're giving a silent witness to their faith. As I was on an airplane, we flew from Louisville to Charlotte, Charlotte to San Jose, and as we were loaded there in, in Charlotte, getting ready for our, our over, care, uh, over the Caribbean flight to San Jose, uh, when we backed away from the gate, and Ryan knows what I'm talking about, but he got pushed back uh, from the gate. And uh, we must have sat on the tarmac for a good 30 minutes. I noticed the lady across the alpha me, she went like this. <laughs> what? Hey, great. We got to the, uh, the, the runway, ready for takeoff, and as we were going down the takeoff, picking up speed, she does this again. And I thought, well, she knows something I don't know, so I crossed myself. <laughs> But it worked because all, all of our luggage got there. 
We landed safely and had a great week. But I told you that to say this. In a baseball game one day, Yogi saw the batter come up to the plate to bat, and with his bat, he made a large cross on home plate. And Yogi leans over with his mitt and just rubs it all out. And says, let's leave God out of this. I want to talk about the cross. What do you think of when I say the word cross or the cross? Well, probably you think of something like this right here. That cross is made of concrete. It's probably a good 12 feet tall. That's what we think of when we think of the word cross. But let me show you something. Here are 454 versions of the cross. The one behind me is, is on, on the, over here, the second one, top line. But after that, there are 453 versions of the cross. When Adolf Hitler chose the swastika as the emblem for his Nazi party, he did not know. What a fool. He did not know that he was picking one version of the cross. And somewhere in the middle here is the swastika. It's one version of the cross. The shamrock is shaped like a cross. Have you ever read the legend of the dogwood tree? Beautiful. Just Google it sometime. The legend of the dogwood tree. A dogwood blossom is shaped just like a cross. It has what they call the brownish red, but those are blood stains. And right in the middle is what looks to be a crown, the legend of the dogwood tree. Now, I've asked these two young guys right here, if you'll come and help me, I want to pass out something. And each one of you take one of these. You take this side over here, and you take the other side over here. And take one, if you would, please. Okay, I just about got everybody. All right. If you would hold your cross up. There's a song, Lift High the Cross, isn't there, Robin? Lift High the Cross. Hold your cross up and repeat after me. I carry a cross in my pocket. A simple, reminder to me a simple reminder to me of the fact that I am a Christian, of the fact that I am Christian. No, matter where I may be. no matter where I may be. This little cross is not magic, nor is it a good luck charm. It isn't meant to protect me from every physical harm. When I put my hand in my pocket to bring out a coin or a key, the cross is there to remind me of the price that he paid for me. So I carry a cross in my pocket, reminding me, no one but me, that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. If only I let him be. Okay, good. Now, after the service and on your way out, I'm going to give each of you a card. 
that contains the poem you just quoted. And I hope that you, and I, I've been, been carrying my cross, forgot which pocket to put it in, but anyway, uh, I've been carrying my cross for years. And I hope that you will just make it a part of your uh, whatever you put in your pocket. Uh, but you carry your cross with you as a daily reminder of God's love for you every day. During uh, World War II, uh, before we entered the European theater, we entered the European theater shortly after we declared war on Japan from December 7th of 41. But uh, before we entered the, the war, uh, Hitler bombed London relentlessly. You ever been to London, England, any of you? Okay. There's a place in London called the Charing Cross. C-H-A-R-I-N-G. It's simply called the Cross. It's a, a familiar landmark to many people who live there, uh, much like Big Ben or Buckingham Palace or Number 10 Downing Street, where the British Prime Minister has lived for centuries. It's where several roads come together, and it's called the cross. Well, Hitler bombed London relentlessly from September of 40 until May of 41. At one point, 57 consecutive nights, the bombs fell. Buildings were destroyed, thousands of lives were lost. And one morning after a night of bombing, a little boy was seen wandering the streets. He was scared. He was confused. He was alone. He was crying. And he was lost. And they asked him his name, and he told them. And then they said, well, where do you live? And he said, I don't know. But if you take me to the cross, I can get home from there. In 1906, there was a lady by the name of Jessie Brown Pounds that wrote a hymn, one of many she wrote, but this one found its way into most of our church hymnals. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go that the way of the cross leads home. Amen? Amen.
rising up in our labors and in our leisure until we all stand before you on that great day where the sun never rises nor sets because God himself is the light. Go with us from this place. We thank you for the cross that you bore it for us. In Jesus' name, amen.